right, let's get started. So um, last time we talked about um, uh, data representation, and then uh, we also talk about a little bit on the Apache Spark and the data frame. So we're going to continue doing that. So uh, today's class is going to be mostly uh, the lab section. So we're going to do a lot of exercise with uh, with programming. So um, like what we've done last time, we're going to use Colab and then uh, we're going to configure Apache Spark over here and then um, we'll go from there. So here um, on Icon, uh, last time we saw this uh, code snippet that I prepared an icon, which you can simply copy and paste into your Colab environment. So to remind you, this is simply to, um, you know, to let you install and configure the uh, Spark environment within Google Colab. So you're basically installing Apache Spark on Google server. So <clears throat> I believe you guys um, may need some time to log on to Icon and uh, open up Google Colab. So I'm just going to um, pause a little bit here to give you a bit of time. Oop, there you go. So last time, I think I mentioned the version issue. And then um, it seems like uh, Apache Spark has released a new version. So um, obviously, the co code snippet that used to work until last week uh, doesn't work anymore. So let me let me try to change the version number. So uh, if you recall, uh, I mentioned uh, the version issue of Apache Spark. So uh, this happens and they do update uh, quite frequently. So um, I guess for today, uh, if you change the version number to 2.4.7, sorry, uh, I think the code will run just fine. Interesting, it worked until Sunday and then um, all of a sudden they uploaded a new version. So 2.4.7 works, okay. And um, to remind you, there are three locations, sorry, four locations, actually. We have uh, 2.4.7 over here and over here, and then the third line, and then lastly, the environment setting. Okay. So I'm going to pause a little bit here. Uh, if you happen to have uh, this cell done and executed without a problem, um, last time what we've done was uh, we, we play with the baseball data set. So that data set is available at the uh, Chadwick Baseball Data Bank. That's the search keyword that you can find the data set. The first page that shows up in GitHub is the link to the data set. So I hope you still remember that. Um, if you go to the baseball data bank, um, there's a core folder. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this uh, people.csv data file. So click on that. And then there's a download, download button. We're not gonna actually download it. We're gonna just copy the link. So right click, copy link address. And that's gonna allow you to copy the URL to the CSV file. So uh, that's gonna be the URL that we'll be using to access the data set. So if you're done with the, the environment setup, the next thing you're gonna do is to uh, wget the data set so that you download, you load it up to the server, okay? And then uh, what you're gonna do is to read uh, the CSP file from Apache Spark, right? So last time I show you uh, how to create a Spark session. So the very first thing always you have to do is to create a Spark session. And to do that, the command is, well, let me blow it up a little bit. So the command is from pyspark.sql import Spark session. And Spark equal to Spark session.builder.app name. 
and app name can be whatever you know you want but here uh, since we're dealing with the baseball data set I'm gonna just call it uh, baseball okay and then get or create is the function that we're looking for So you don't have to try too hard to memorize all this because uh, we're going to, I mean, uh, this first two lines is, are, are the ones that we're going to type all the time whenever we try to use Spark. Uh, these two lines are necessary. So you will naturally kind of get to memorize uh, the command. So if you created a new session, uh, the next thing you want to do is then to read a CSV file. Uh, so we just downloaded the people.csv, so um, you can simply read the CSV file by calling spark.read.csv, people.csv. And then last time I explained to you uh, a couple of useful options. One is to uh, set header equals to true. Uh, this is to recognize that the first line of the CSV file contains the column names. And then the other option that I mentioned last time was infer schema. So if you recall, we talk about uh, this database jargon called schema. Schema in a simple language is basically a structure of a data set. So schema defines the data type of the columns, column names, uh, and some of the options. Uh, in case of Spark, we talk about nullability last time, right? So that's kind of the basic, um, you know, uh, set of commands that you want to execute for to get started. Okay, so I'm going to um, pause here a little bit for those of you who are still um, setting up the environment. All right, so unless, if you, unless you don't have any other question, uh, I'm going to move ahead to the, uh, to the next activity. So last time we talked about some basics of data frame, but we haven't really talked about uh, how to play with the data frame. So I'm gonna show you a couple of things. So the first thing is uh, this function called uh, df.show. And obviously this is to display the content, contents of the database. So uh, as you can see in the data set, we have a player ID, the birth year, birth month, birth day, birth country, birth state. Uh, and the def information, uh, we have the name, uh, first name and last name. Uh, we have weight, height, uh, the side of the arm that, you know, they're on bat, side of the arm that they throw, the debut date and uh, the retirement date, um, and then a couple of other IDs uh, for um, compatibility with the uh, other data sets. So uh, what we're gonna care about uh, today mostly is going to be player ID and um, perhaps player names, okay? And then uh, later on, we're gonna actually uh, load up um, a new data file. Uh, we're gonna actually play with the betting.csv, which contains the information of the, the betters, um, uh, the performance of the betters. And then we're gonna see uh, how to mesh up two different data sets in Spark and then uh, make a kind of, um, you know, gigantic data, data set that combines the information from uh, two different data sources, which is going to be quite useful. Okay, so df.show is a simple function to, to display things. Uh, there's an option for you to set it, uh, specify how many lines you want to display. Uh, so df.show n equals to five uh, will allow you to display only the top five rows. So uh, this can be quite useful uh, when, you know, since you can define how many lines you want to see. Uh, by default, uh, n is set to be 20. So if you don't type anything, it's going to display only the first 20 rows. Obviously, you know, setting n equals to a large number is, you know, not a desirable thing because um, if you recall, last time I explained that the Spark database, even though from the user's perspective, even though from your perspective, it looks like a simple function that parses a CSV file. But what happens behind the scene is it is actually 
um, you know, uh, creating a CSV file that is distributed over multiple data nodes, right? And then uh, as you call df.show, what happens is Spark sends a message to the data nodes that contains that information and then try to fetch the information from multiple data nodes. So in the actual big data setup, uh, it is not a good idea actually to uh, send the query that is really heavy. So uh, I, I hope you remember that. Uh, but anyways, uh, that's, that's the role of df.show. Now here I'm going to show you uh, another simple thing, which is df.describe. Okay, so describe is a function that creates another data frame. So the result of running df.describe is yet another data frame. So um, for simplicity, let me just call it new df, okay? And since, you know, the output of the describe function is a data frame, uh, we can call new df.show as, as if we were able to call df.show in the original data frame. The, the new data frame, okay, uh, created by the describe function is basically a data frame that contains a summary statistics of the entire data set. So as you can see over here, we have a uh, total number of uh, data samples available. Uh, the average across, um, you know, the entire data samples, standard deviation, minimum and maximum. Okay, so uh, if you look at birth year, um, we have total of 190, sorry, 19,954 uh, items uh, where we have birth year. And then the average birth year of the players is uh, 1934. Okay, and then the, the standard deviation of the birth year is 42.7. Uh, the minimum birth year. So the oldest player uh, in this database was born in on 1820. Wow. And then the youngest player has was born in uh, 2000. Okay. We have uh, similar statistics for birth month, uh, birthday, uh, and then many other columns. Um, like for example, weight and height. Uh, you can see the average body weight and the average body, average stature. Uh, of the baseball player uh, in the, throughout the MLB history. So um, again, let me try to um, explain to you again. It doesn't really sound awfully impressive. I mean, those are simple, you know, summary statistics. We just counted how many uh, data samples are available. Uh, average is nothing but a summation of the values and divided by the number of uh, data samples, standard deviation, you know how to compute it, uh, min and max. I mean, those are all the things that you can compute uh, pretty easily with whatever tool that's available to you. For example, uh, if you have a Microsoft Excel, uh, then you can create simply a formula to compute the mean and the standard deviation. You can compute the minimum and the maximum value. So it doesn't look awfully impressive right, um, by looking at what's been displayed over here. But remember, this happens in a distributed computing system, okay? So what actually happens behind the scene is not uh, a simple calculation. What actually happened was uh, when, you know, you call this new, dot, new DF dot show, what actually happened behind the scene was that the Spark kind of optimized your query in a distributed sense, and then it has distributed the, the query command and then, uh, you know, across the uh, distributed data nodes. And then each of the nodes basically computed the local mean, local standard deviation, local minimum and local maximum, right? And those are the mapping operation. Uh, last time we talked about map reduce, right? So that's a mapping out operation. And then each local statistics are being sent back to the master node where reducing operation happens. And the reducing operation, to help you recall, was an operation to consolidate the local computation, right? The distributed computation result 
and then produce a consolidated output. Okay, so if you think about it, there's actually, you know, a lot more happens, you know, behind the scene, even though on the surface, from the user's perspective, it doesn't uh, really look like anything complicated. And that's probably the, you know, the biggest, you know, benefit of Spark, right? From a data scientist's perspective, you don't really have to worry too much about how actually you're going to split it and then how you're going to actually distribute that operation across, you know, multiple data nodes. Instead, there are already functions and, you know, routines that are defined uh, under the hood so that without having to worry about the actual distribution of the map, you know, actual uh, mappers and reducers, you can just compute the summary statistics and later on we're going to see uh, some other uh, operations uh, that can be done in Spark, okay? So that's uh, something I wanted to, uh, wanted to emphasize, okay? Now, <clears throat> we're going to go on to uh, then see some additional operations that might be useful uh, for you guys. And uh, by the way, uh, Thursday, so the next class is going to be an in-class activity. And then uh, during the activity, I'm going to assign you some problems to work on. <clears throat> and then the, the activity includes uh, computing the, uh, the career best, you know, performance, performers, uh, in terms of uh, total career home run, uh, total number of hits throughout the career, uh, total number of wins for pitchers, and, you know, things like that. So I'm going to just uh, throw a data set on you, and then uh, I'm going to ask you guys to split out into the breakout room, and then uh, you'll have a chance to, you know, uh, work as a group to come up with the summary statistics uh, from the data set. So what we're going to learn today is going to be extremely useful for that. Okay. So with that being said, uh, let's do something more fun. So uh, <clears throat> if you scroll up a little bit, um, you know, for, for this example, we use the people.csv file. Let me create another code cell right below that. Well, actually, the location of the cell doesn't really matter. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to download another CSV file and then create another data frame, okay? Uh, and uh, maybe in this example, let's use betting.csv, okay? So if I run this, by the way, uh, dash Q is basically uh, mute the output of uh, wget command. So you don't really have to type uh, dash Q. It's just to make the, the, the notebook clean. Sorry, I think I used it without explanation. So I just downloaded the batting.csv file in our uh, virtual Hadoop cluster, right? <coughs> now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm gonna just, you know, cheat and copy uh, the previous line that we have um, typed. And then I'm gonna, you know, scroll all the way to the bottom and then create a code cell. Now, um, here, I am going to create a data frame for people. And then similarly, I'm going to create a data frame for betting records. And that's got to be in betting.csv. OK. <clears throat> So we all look, we all know how the the betting data frame look like. Uh, sorry, the people data frame look like. So I'm gonna just show you uh, how the betting data frame look like. And then it contains the information of the player ID, uh, ear ID, um, and then uh, I'm gonna skip this uh, STint and then uh, team ID, uh, and then we have some baseball statistics. So. Uh, G, for example, is the number of games that the, the person played. Um, uh, run is the, the score that uh, the player has produced. HR is home run. Um, H is a hit, um, second base and third base. Um, and then RBI is the, um, um, the, the, the average. Uh, and then we have um, uh, base stills and, um, you know, um, based on balls and, you know, a lot of other 
baseball statistics are available here. So uh, if you're not a big baseball fan and if you don't understand those ab abbreviations, that's all right because the only thing we're going to play with today is home run. And home run is HR. Okay. Now, um, what uh, we're going to do today is to manipulate the columns, manipulate the data so that we can produce a data frame that is uh, in the form of what we uh, desire to have. So um, here, the first operation you want to uh, be aware of is how to select columns. And selecting a column is actually pretty simple. Okay, so from DF betting, and as if you're accessing a dictionary, you can put a square bracket and then within the square bracket, you just type the name of the column and that's it. And by doing this, you'll be able to retrieve a specific column from the data set. Now, the type, okay, type is a function that is native to Python. So it's nothing about uh, Spark, it's a, it's a Python thing. I believe that was covered in the uh, in the Python lecture. Uh, so type of DFHR, okay? <clears throat> if you run this command, oops, sorry, what happened? Uh, bum, bum, bum. Oh, sorry, DF batting. And as you can see, the data type of this command over here is pi spark column. Okay, so it's a, it's a column object. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that a column object is different from the data frame itself. So here's a common mistake, which is a lot of people, a lot of beginners assume that this is another data frame and they try to do an operation directly on this, you know, this column. So for example, uh, the only function that we know about data frame is dot show, right? And, you know, this is kind of a common mistake that uh, a lot of beginners make. So they assume that uh, DF betting HR column is a data frame. And therefore, they assume that the show function should also be available for this. But if you run this, you will actually come across an error. Okay, and this is this is natural. This is uh, this is not because of a bug or you know or anything. This is the way that it is designed, and it is in fact very important to remember column object. <clears throat> we're gonna see this uh, in, in today's lecture, but it's basically like a pointer. It's not the information itself. So if you ever learn C programming, you probably heard about this thing called a pointer. Or if you haven't, you know, uh, studied C++ or, you know, C language, um, pointer is basically an address of where the information is located. It's not the information itself. Okay. So a column object is something that is kind of like a pointer conceptually. It holds an information of how to retrieve the actual data, but it does not hold the data itself. So when you try to show, when you try to display a column, obviously Spark will spit out an error because this is simply an address. It's not the information, it's not the data itself, okay? Um, we're gonna talk about this uh, difference uh, between column object and a data frame object pretty soon and things will become much clearer, okay? But for now, uh, I want you to remember that a column object is different from a data frame object. If you want to retrieve a data frame object, if you want to retrieve a column as a data frame object, then here's, uh, here's another option. Instead of the square bracket, you can actually um, call a function called select and would then, and again, I forgot to put df underscore betting. 
And then here I enter the type, uh, sorry, the column name of the column that I'm interested in retrieving. Now, if I run this, uh-oh, there's something different. So previously, um, you know, when I used the square bracket, the data time was data type was column. Now the data type is data frame, which means the show function that was available for data frames can be applied for this thing that you just retrieved, okay? So now we have a data frame with a single column that's called home runs. And then you can see the numbers are displayed over here. So far so good? Yeah, you can, you can always feel free to uh, type your question um, during the lecture. Uh, I'm, I'm monitoring uh, the chat window. Well, so um, let me actually uh, try to answer some of the questions before I move ahead, okay? And is your variable name DF underscore people or DF underscore betting? Uh, it's, uh, it's actually both. Um, if you remember, we downloaded um, uh, two CSV files, okay? And uh, one CSV file was a people.csv. The other one was a betting.csv. Um, and then we actually loaded uh, both of the data frames together. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, here's another question. For me, it is uh, interesting to know the number of rows in a CSV. Um, usually the, the, the trick that I use is I call the df.describe and then it'll display the count for each of the columns. And you will notice that the count is different across the columns because there are missing data. And that's quite common in, in big data scenario, right? So what I usually do is then to take the maximum of this count row. And it seems like without, you know, actually running any command, it seems like, um, you know, 200,000, sorry, 20,068 is the maximum in this uh, first row. So from that, I can conclude that we have a total of 20,000 rows <clears throat> in the CSV file. So that, that's, that's usually what I do. We get to work with, uh, you know, far, far bigger than this. Obviously, you're going to see, you know, numbers like millions or, you know, uh, really crazy large numbers. And again, uh, my strategy will be the same. Um, DF.describe will be the, the function that I'll be using. Uh, Spark is actually quite well optimized. So even if you have millions of rows, it will spit out the result pretty soon, pretty quickly. So df.describe is a go-to function when it comes to the summary statistics. Yes. So let's, uh, let's go back to what we've been doing. So <clears throat> we just talked about um, how to select uh, or how to slice, uh, you know, a separate column out of, uh, out of a data frame. Uh, now, the good thing about the select function is you can actually select multiple column names. So, for example, uh, from DF betting, you can select uh, not only, let's see, what would be interesting, not only home run, but you can also select player ID. And in that case, you separate that with comma and then provide that as a list. So you, you see the structure here? So we're, we're providing a list of column names. So this is the list that I highlighted it as, a, as an input argument to the select function. And as a result of that, it's gonna retrieve the two columns and there you go. You can create a subset uh, from the original data set, okay? Um, of course, you know, there's no limit in terms of the length. So uh, you can also add the year ID if you want, if you're curious about the year, right? And as you can see, we have another column that says year ID. So as far as the column name exists in the original data set, there's no limitations in terms of how many columns you want to produce. Okay. 
So that's actually quite um, a useful uh, thing to know because later on, what we're going to do is we're going to create a kind of a custom data set based off of, you know, um, by, by merging, by extracting some sub data sets from the original data set and then merging them and then processing them. So that's kind of the basics of, uh, of data mining. Um, there was uh, another question about the column uh, index and that's a great question. So the question is, uh, can you select the column IDs uh, with numbers too? Uh, my answer is yes, and, um, but it's not recommended because, um, well, the indexing, um, Spark needs to convert that into column names anyways. And if you rely on the numerical index of the column name, there is a very good chance that you will mess up, um, you know, your data set later because we're, we're talking about a large data system. And then, you know, last time when we uh, talk about some basics of Hadoop, we uh, kind of, one of the important characteristics of the Hadoop data system was that uh, in case of a conventional SQL data system, you know, databases, uh, schema had to be enforced by the time of writing, which means there's a gatekeeper when a new data, you know, enters, enters the territory, right? But in case of Hadoop, we don't have that gatekeeping process, if you remember, right? So what that means is there is actually no kind of a solid rule that says uh, index number zero is going to be always player ID. Index number three is going to be always home run. Uh, there, there's no solid rule for that. And then uh, usually Hadoop databases uh, dynamically evolve. So there is a way to specify column numbers, but I don't, I don't recommend you to do that. My recommendation is always stick with the, with the column name. Um, with that being said, now we're gonna talk about selecting rows, okay? We, we just talked about selecting uh, columns. Now we're gonna talk about selecting rows. And then uh, we'll do the data processing. So the first uh, uh, method that we're gonna talk about is this thing called the df.head. And what you do is basically provide the number of rows that you're interested in. And obviously it retrieves the first n number of rows from the original database, okay? So it's, uh, it's pretty similar to df.show except that df.show, the purpose of it is to display, um, you know, the contents of the data frame. Here, we're actually retrieving the row objects. So similar to column objects, uh, we have row objects, okay? And as you can see, we have, uh, we have a square bracket. And then at the end over here, uh, close square bracket. So what that means is uh, what df.head returns is essentially a list, right? It's a Python list of rows. So uh, for example, if I define um, this as rows, and then if I go by, um, you know, rows dot, uh, sorry, square bracket two, then uh, the second column, I'm counting based on zero, zero base, right? So the second column is going to be displayed as you can see over here, okay? So uh, for example, if you go, um, for example, df uh, betting dot head, uh, and then let's say 10, the type of that is, like I said, it's a Python list, and then the elements inside of it is pi spark row, okay? So that's the row object. And again, similar to uh, column objects, row objects themselves are not uh, the actual data frame. So what I mean by that is obviously, uh, if you do df.head uh, or df, .df underscore betting dot head 
10.show, then it's going to complain. <coughs> okay. Um, now, as if we had the two options to retrieve columns, we have also two options for, for retrieving the row objects. So had was one of them. The other one is called the limit. So df underscore betting dot limit is a way that you retrieve the first 10 rows from the database and convert that as a new data frame. So what that means, I can, for example, call show. Remember, the show function was only available uh, for data frames, right? So the fact that we are able to call dot show means that the output of df underscore dot betting, uh, sorry, df underscore betting dot limit, the output of that is actually a data frame, okay? Now, you may wonder uh, if there's a way to access rows by index numbers. So this is actually uh, the same question that um, I was asked uh, earlier in today's lecture. And the answer is no. In case of rows, there's no way to, well, there, there is a way, but you have to kind of gather around with it. So I, I, I have to, you know, I, I cannot say that there is no way. There is a way, but there is no native interface uh, in Spark where you can access the, the rows by using the row index. So actually the trick is um, you can actually add a new column that, that is called the index, and then you can retrieve a row by searching through that, um, you know, the row index column. But, you know, that's, that's kind of a get around. So there is no natural way to uh, access a particular row by a row number. And this is actually important. The reason why there's no interface for that is because in big data scenario, that's very unlikely operation. Imagine you have millions of rows, right? What's the value of retrieving, let's say, uh, row number 7,285, <laughs> right? So in terms of the usefulness, uh, it's not gonna be very useful um, and actually, you know, uh, there's a, not a lot of cases where uh, you would want to retrieve, uh, you know, certain rows by the row number. Instead, what is, uh, what is, what can be really useful is uh, this thing called the DF, uh, let's say DF betting uh, dot where. And then here we're going to put condition. Um, I'm just putting a placeholder. Uh, and then, you know, uh, something, something dot where function will return a data frame. So you can simply um, show the contents of the data frame that is returned by df underscore betting where. Okay. Now, there are many ways to define conditions. Uh, first uh, option is to use a function that is provided uh, that is inherent to the column object. So for example, uh, let's say I'm interested in year ID, okay? And then the column objects has a function called between. And this is a function literally to uh, generate a SQL, sorry, generate a query to retrieve values in between you know, uh, the numbers that are specified by the user. So let's say uh, I want to retrieve between 2000 and uh, 2002, okay? And then uh, run this cell. Oops, sorry, I forgot to put DF underscore betting. And as you can see, uh, PySpark is able to retrieve uh, rows, okay? whose year ID is between 2000 and 2002, inclusive. Okay, so 2000, 2001, and 2002. So that's, that's one way. 
it's it's a function provided by uh, PySpark. But there are actually um, more intuitive ways. So as a matter of fact, if you create a new code cell, and just for fun, if you drag this component, I mean, this fragment here, and then copy it, um, and then just execute that part only, then you will see that it returns a column object with a condition in it. So this is where um, the distinction between data frames and column objects becomes very important. So remember, um, let me uh, scroll to where, yeah, here. Uh, remember when I was explaining uh, the column object, I told you that column objects are not data frames themselves and it is kind of like a pointer, okay? So to be more precise, the column objects are in fact uh, kind of query objects. So what's, uh, what's happening behind the scene is, you know, as you, as you type something like this, PySpark will create a column object and the column object is kind of an optimized Hadoop query to retrieve the entire elements from that query. If you're, if you're used to SQL uh, databases, you will realize this is actually pretty similar to SQL. And that's true. Uh, what Apache Spark does is, you know, uh, it provides an interface to Hadoop databases uh, in a way that is quite similar to SQL databases so that, you know, many data scientists who are already familiar with uh, SQL databases can, you know, uh, jump immediately onto Spark. So that's, uh, that's kind of an advantage. And what that means is we can actually create a lot of queries by using the column object. So the between function is a query function that is defined, uh, I mean, that is predefined off the shelf. But in the meantime, you can do something like this. DF underscore betting, year ID, and then instead of calling between function, you can use actually uh, the native uh, Boolean operator, sorry, the, the native uh, logical operators that are, uh, that are inherent to Python language. So for example, uh, DF betting um, smaller than, um, I don't know, 2000. So anyone who has played uh, in the previous uh, <clears throat> millennia, is going to be retrieved by doing this. And then in fact, if you run this command, you will see that a column object has been created with a condition year ID has to be smaller than 2000. So we're basically creating a query, okay? Uh, like I said, again, column object itself, column object itself is not a data frame. So we have not retrieved any information. We just created a search keyword. Okay, that's what, um, um, in a high level, that's what uh, uh, what query means. And of course, you can create a complicated query by combining uh, different queries together. So for example, uh, let's say um, you want to find people, um, who played, I don't know, again, 2012. So let's say you are interested in retrieving the information of the people who played between 2000 and 2002, um, then you know this is simply the way that you can create um, that command. So, and obviously if you want to be inclusive of the boundary, then uh, you can just add an equal sign. And as you can see, uh, the column object that's created by running this command is basically the same as the query object that's created by calling the between function. So between function is useful when you don't want to type all this, but in my case, I usually go with, uh, with this because I guess it's more explicit, right? Uh, sometimes uh, when you call between function, you're not quite sure about 
you know, if the, uh, the, the, the values are inclusive or exclusive. Um, whereas here, everything is pretty explicit. So this is kind of my uh, go-to ways of generating queries. And obviously you don't have to stick with just one column if you have uh, other conditions. So let's say I want not only the players that played between 2000 and 2002, I also want the ones who had, um, I, I don't know, EF betting, uh, number of home runs greater than, um, let's say 30. So 30 is actually a decent number of home runs per season. So if I do this, then the query has become a little more, you know, sophisticated and, and, and became more specific. Um, of course, um, I can add, you know, uh, how many number of condition I want to add. You can just simply uh, use the ampersand to add additional specification. Uh, of course, you are allowed to use the uh, this bar. I, I don't know what the name of this, uh, I, I always call bar. So you can add this bar uh, as an OR operator. So there's no, um, I mean, distinction between uh, what you could do with the native Python and what you could do with um, uh, Apache Spark. So Spark, again, is pretty powerful in that sense because uh, in terms of learning curve, uh, you can actually uh, learn how to use Spark uh, pretty easily, right? So again, um, I just copy the same uh, condition over here, right below. What I'm going to do is to call df.where, df, sorry, df uh, underscore betting.where. And then um, I'm gonna retrieve the information. So df where uh, show, let me break the lines uh, for you guys so that you can see everything uh, in one line. Yeah, this is better, right? So as I run this cell, um, now I have players that played uh, between year 2000 and 2002 uh, who has hit it more than 30 home runs. So as you can see, we have actually quite a bit of players. So um, let, let, let's see if I can increase it to uh, 40. And still I have more than 20 uh, players. How about uh, 45? Wasn't McGuire um, played during that period? I think so. So that's the time where we saw a crazy number of home runs. So maybe I can change it to 50. There you go. So, um, you know, among the players who played uh, in season 2000, 2001, and 2002, uh, there are only, you know, handful amount of players who recorded more than 50 home runs. And these are the ones um, that are available here. Um, in, in the betting.csv file, we don't have the player names. We only have a player ID and later on in today's class, we're going to learn how to merge the two tables. But by looking at the player ID, it seems like the first one is uh, Barry Bonds. Um, I think I see Sammy Salsa. Um, I don't know who the other people are. We'll, we'll figure out pretty soon. Okay. But that's, uh, that's uh, something I really wanted to emphasize. That's the way that Spark works. So if you just call a column like this, it doesn't really retrieve anything from the distributed file system. Remember, whenever you try to retrieve the actual data from the distributed storage, there's overhead, right? Because you need to, first of all, talk to the name node, and then the name node will have to pull up the metadata and then figure out where the information are recorded and then send a message to the data node, hey, uh, I, need, uh, I need you to re retrieve this information. And then you send that message to the data nodes and then the data nodes are going to send the information to the name node and then the name node will have to consolidate everything and then you know, display it to you. So whenever you try to retrieve something, to, whenever you try to see the actual value, there's an overhead that you have to pay. So Spark is intentionally designed in a way that can minimize that kind of traffic of information. So when you define uh, this kind of conditions, for example, and later on, we're actually going to learn how to add columns, which is pretty simple. 
But my point here is whenever you're trying to run something, run some calculation using the column uh, of the, you know, from the data set, it does not actually compute that. It just generate an optimized query and then be ready to send that to the data nodes so that it can retrieve the information whenever the user wants to see. Anyways, that's an important thing that I uh, wanted to emphasize, the, the concept of optimized queries. So remember, again, until the very moment that you call explicitly dot show, okay, which is a function that requests Spark to retrieve the actual numbers, okay, until you type that, everything is going to be in the form of search queries. For example, here, this line, everything is going to exist in a form of search queries until the very moment you expl explicitly say, hey, I want to see the values, okay? So that's a very, very, very important thing to remember, okay? I'm gonna emphasize this, um, you know, in the later examples as well. So I'm, I'm just uh, going to move on unless you guys have additional questions. So uh, we're almost getting to the end. Um, the only thing, uh, well, there are two things that's left I wanna mention. Uh, first thing is, uh, this is another useful operation, which is to create a new column. Okay, so df dot with column returns a data, the, the original data frame with an additional column. So let's say you're somehow interested in uh, the ratio between the number of, say, home runs and the number of base stills. Okay, I, I don't know uh, what practical meaning it has, but let's just assume that you're interested in that metric. So I'm gonna create um, a new column called the HR2, uh, SB is a stolen base. So the number of base stills. And um, what I can do is simply just provide a math equation like this. So I want to divide, sorry, and uh, it's supposed to be df underscore betting. I'm keep making that mistake. So df betting, the number of home runs divided by df underscore betting, uh, the, the number of stolen bases. And then I want to create a new column that contains the result of this computation in a new data frame. So this is going to create a new data frame. So if you run this cell, it simply is a data frame. And again, remember, we haven't requested Spark to show me the actual, show us the actual value. So still it exists in the format of an optimized query, okay? Now if I type dot show, it will actually send out that query to the slave nodes and then let them compute the information and then produce a data frame. And there you go. You see, um, where's the scroll bar? So if I scroll all the way to the right here, you can see that I have a new column called uh, HR to SP, which is the ratio between uh, home run and uh, stolen bases. In case I think we have uh, both zero so zero divided by zero, uh, it is computed as null, but otherwise uh, you'll see the ratio between the home runs and the stolen bases, okay? So in fact, um, there are many other functions that you can do. So instead of ratio, you can just add the numbers together. Again, I don't know what practical meaning uh, in terms of uh, actual baseball statistics, but I'm, I'm here to show you that uh, you can actually add, uh, subtract, uh, divide, multiply the numbers or columns together. Um, it doesn't have to be binary operation. You can have more than two terms. 
So instead of uh, home run to uh, stolen base ratio, you can just, you know, add up uh, columns, um, you know, in whatever way that you want to add. So again, uh, practically there's probably no meaning to just add the number of home runs uh, with the uh, at bat, uh, how many times uh, the person was at bat uh, minus the number of stolen bases. But that's basically uh, a legitimate operation uh, in terms of Spark syntax. And again, uh, again, I yet again emphasize, this is very important. I yet again emphasize, if you do this, instead of actually doing the computation, it will just create an optimized query. Okay, so we have not yet sent out the, uh, the, the, the tasks to the distributed computing nodes, okay? So I'm emphasizing this a lot and there, there's a reason for that, right? Uh, it's important to, to understand how the distributed data systems work, okay? Um, in case you have uh, a formula that involves more than just those basic uh, uh, arithmetic operation, uh, don't worry, Spark comes with this set of uh, mathematical functions um, and to use them, you can import pyspark.sql.functions. And since the name is uh, pretty long, I'm gonna just import it as f, okay? And what you can do is f.exponential, for example, um, number of home runs, uh, divided by, um, I don't know, cosine, uh, I don't know what's the use of cosine of uh, the number of stolen bases, but just to show you that this is all, you know, possible. So in case you have some complicated science problem, right, you have sensors distributed across the manufacturing plant, and then they're all submitting some signal. And then in case you want to, you know, I don't know, compute something that involves cosines, sines, exponentials, uh, logarithms, uh, whatever, you name it. Uh, everything that you learn from uh, engineering math class should be available uh, in this module. So simply just f.cos, f.exponential, and so on and so forth. And again, I emphasize yet again, the, the formula that you have just executed here exists in a form of an optimized query, not the data itself, okay? So I, I emphasize that multiple times. So uh, I hope you guys remember that because that's very, very important. Now, you know, since now you know how to compute this kind of thing, uh, you can either um, uh, generate a new data frame by calling dot with column or, you know, use that as a search query, right? Obviously, uh, there may be situations where you want to find um, the ratio of the exponential of the home run and the cosine of uh, stolen bases uh, is less than, um, I don't know, bigger than five. I don't know what I'm doing, but, you know, you can create this kind of um, uh, relationship and then use it as a search query. And then it's gonna create a data frame object, okay? And then the moment that you type show, then it's gonna retrieve the, the number, the, 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 the rows that satisfy this condition. So um, again, uh, dot where, data frame dot where, and data frame dot with column, those are uh, the two really useful and um, frequently used functions, uh, they'll be quite useful for your um, consulting projects, uh, as well as doing um, in-class activities uh, on Thursday. Um, well, I guess we have only five minutes. That's all right. Um, instead of trying to rush uh, and try to squeeze everything in, let me just uh, explain one last thing. So here's, uh, here's an advanced operation that combines everything. So we, we learned how to select um, um, a subset of columns. Um, and sorry, let's say stolen basis. And then 
uh, here with column um, and then add, um, I don't know, HR to SB. And then that is defined as, um, well, let me, let me break it down to make it easier to understand. So this is, um, this is a new data frame, right? And then within that new data frame, you can uh, call with column operation. And then here's uh, DF new HR divided by DF new um, SB. And that can be yet another data frame. So DF new two. And if you show DF new two dot uh, show, then you will see a new table that has a home run uh, stolen bases and a home run to stolen base ratio. All right, thank you. Yep, that was a good question. Um, the one last thing, I I'm gonna just you know, show you a really simple thing, which is um, dfbetting.sort, okay? Um, sort is basically, again, uh, I mean, literally, it's a function to sort values based off of their magnitude, right? So for example, let's say you want to rank everybody uh, in terms of the number of home runs, you can simply just go by uh, dfbetting.sort and then within the parentheses, dfbetting uh, number of home runs uh, and then uh, in a descending order, okay? And then that creates a data frame which means you can call the show function in order to actually see the values. And here you can see, if you look at the home run column, you can see that the players has been sorted based off of the number of home runs per season. Okay, so Barry Bones uh, has a record of 73 home runs per season. Uh, I think this is Mark McGuire. Uh, has a 70 home run per season. Uh, Sammy Sosa has 66, and Mark McGuire again, 65, and, and so on and so forth. So you can sort the numbers based off of, um, um, you know, what, what you want to see. And of course, for sorting, you can have multiple conditions. So um, what would be a good uh, example here? So uh, look at this. Uh, the, the part that I, well, this is even better. The part that I highlighted, okay? So the three players over here has total of 58 home runs per season. So they are ranked tie. Let's say you want to further differentiate them, further sort them um, based on, I don't know, based on the number of three base hits, okay? So 3B is three base hits. And then we have nine, one, four. So let's say you want to uh, further sort them based off of the uh, three base hits. And that's really simple. You can just uh, type the, the column name. And then let's say you want to do it in an ascending order. So in the order of getting bigger. Uh, if I run this command again, now I go back to those three players who had 58 home runs. Now it's been ordered uh, in a way that uh, one, you know, the, the, the number of three base hits kind of increases within uh, those uh, that are ranked high in, in, the, in the number of home runs. So um, the sort function is really powerful in that sense. You can simply just append additional sorting conditions. And then the, the one that comes first is the one that has the highest priority. And then when there's a, there, there are ties, then the next condition is going to be applied to sort it out. And then, you know, if there's still a tie, then the next condition is going to be applied and then the next condition and then the next condition. So again, this is uh, this is very useful uh, function that you can uh, utilize to get a better sense of what's going on in your, in your data set. So if you combine that with what we've learned earlier, uh, the limit function. Uh, so in that way, for example, you can um, pull up the top five uh, players in terms of the total number of home runs per season. 
Now I have a top five players on the list. Okay. So that was the basics of data mining. Um, uh, on the Thursday's class, I'm going to show you how to merge two tables together to produce even more useful information uh, from your data set. And then based off of that, I'm going to give you some activities to do during the class. Uh, so it's not a, like a homework that you have to um, take home, pun intended, uh, and then, you know, have to submit by deadline. It's going to be like an in-class activity where uh, you come to the class and then do everything in class. And then I'll be just, um, you know, popping into those breakout rooms and um, talk with you guys to, to see uh, if there's any problem and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the Thursday's class is going to be really uh, uh fun um, in-class you know, hands-on activities. So thank you very much, guys. And then um, I'll see you on Thursday.